welcome to our Bible study in the Psalms. This is Pastor Derek Walker of the Oxford Bible Church, and we have come to the wonderful Psalm 63. So let's start by reading it. Psalm 63, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus will I bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Because you've been my help, therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go down, shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword, they shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory, but the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. Uh, this is actually a, a very famous psalm in the early church, in the Greek-speaking early church, and in uh, they would sing it at the start of every Sunday morning service, uh, and uh, also in the Armenian church. It would be part of the Eucharist, and uh, so the early church really, va really valued this psalm, and we might say it's one of the great devotional psalms. Uh, it's a psalm of David, and uh, we get one of, uh, well, I would say modern choruses from it that, that I remember from my early days as a Christian, um, which actually come from uh, verse 3 and 4, which I'll... Uh, sing very quickly you, you may have heard of this or not it might be before your time but <clears throat> your loving kindness is better than life your loving kindness is better than life my lips shall praise thee thus will i bless thee thy loving kindness is better than life i lift my hands up unto thy name i lift my hands up unto thy name thy lips shall praise thee thus will i bless thee thy loving kindness is better than life praise god and that's from one of the great verses of this psalm i'm i'm calling this psalm really, uh, uh, winning in the wilderness this is a from a time in david's life when he was knocked down but not knocked out and uh, we're told actually that it was when he was in the wilderness of of judah and we're told also in verse 11 because you see there are two times when david was in the wilderness as it were fleeing we we find in the psalm that he he is separated from god he's separate well not from god but he's separated from the sanctuary He's separated from uh, the tabernacle, the temple. And he is in the wilderness because he is pursued by his enemies. And near the end of the psalm, he, he talks about these enemies. And uh, the first time was, of course, when he was on the run from Saul, before he became king. And then there was this great incident that we've seen, in fact, we saw it was the context for the last two Psalms, 61 and 62. And, and in fact, Psalm 63 is very similar in tone to those Psalms, especially Psalm 61. You'll see a lot of co connections there. And all of those Psalms, including Psalm 63, were actually not when he was on the run from Saul, but on the run from his son Absalom, who had rebelled against him and had brought was usurping his throne he had 
declared himself king in Hebron and was invading Jerusalem. And David had to flee into the wilderness of Judah. And this is this fits this psalm. And uh, in particular, um, we know that it's this one because in verse 11, I believe it is, he says, uh, but the king shall rejoice in God. The psalm only makes sense if the, if the king, he's talking about himself, David. And so he is already king, all right? Um, he wouldn't have said that if he was still, although he'd been anointed by Samuel, when Saul was fleeing, um, was chasing him, David was not king. And that would have been presumptuous for him to call himself the king while the, someone else was king. So clearly, this is from, again, the time of Absalom's rebellion, one of David's hardest times when he's dealing with this rebellion and he is outnumbered, he's on the run. And he and a few of his friends, not a great force, uh, were fleeing into the wilderness of, of Judah. And um, let's have a quick look at the context of that. It's in 2 Samuel chapter fif uh, 15. It says, verse 23, at, the, at this time, David is going over the Mount of Olives and into the wilderness of Judea to get away from Absalom's army. And it says, all the country wept with a loud voice and the people crossed over, and that's the Kidron. The king himself crossed over the brook Kidron when all the people crossed over toward the way of the wilderness. So they're heading towards the wilderness, which is going down towards the Dead Sea. It's really the Jericho Road, you know, that you, you read about in the uh, story of the Good Samaritan. And then in verse 28, 2, 1, 2 Samuel 15, 28, he, he, David says to people who are going to send him messages, See, I will wait in the plains of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me, to see what's, what's happening. And then in chapter 2 Samuel 16, verse 14, it says, Now the king and all the people who were with him became weary, and so they refreshed themselves there. So they, they went down into the wilderness area, in the plains kind of leading towards the Dead Sea, which was quite a march. And so they, they would have marched this, you know, in the evening and up to midnight probably. And so they were weary. And interestingly, that's the same word that we're going to find in Psalm 63 verse 1, where he talks about himself being thirsty or, or weary. Um, and, and so... Uh, that's a, a connection and it says they refreshed themselves in other words they they took a rest there and this is the setting of the psalm because we're going to see in psalm 5 he talks about how he is med he doesn't david doesn't really sleep that well but he still refreshes himself because he is uh meditating on god he says let's have a look at that verse actually verse 6 when i remember you on my bed i meditate on you in the night watches this is a military word it's through the watches of the night when different people would have taken turns to to be on the watch if there is an enemy and David and his men had to look out for a pot, the enemy possibly approaching in the night um, and and so during these night watches while they were watching out David actually was <laughs> couldn't really sleep but he was meditating on God through the night he and this uh, psalm actually is very much set as, as we will see in a time of trial you know he is on the run from his son this is one of the low points of his life and uh, he is in the wilderness and him being in the wilderness is is physical location but it also describes you know emotionally how he would have felt in this in this situation his kingdom being taken from him most of his people turning against him and and he would have really felt like he was in the wilderness you know that's people talk about a wilderness experience and it's the hard times when we go through life when it seems like nothing in life really is is giving us much joy it's it's hard you know and uh this is the time when we really have to turn to God and find our satisfaction in him. And this is what David does. He is in the wilderness physically, but also he's, he's going through a wilderness experience. But he shows us in this psalm 
the true devotion to God, turning to God, how to turn to God in the midst of such a trial. And through turning to God, he receives God's strength and God's satisfaction. And he get, he comes into great confidence that God's going to give him the victory. God's going to vindicate him because all these enemies were slandering him. And so this psalm is a great setting. And so the setting of the psalm, as I said, is, is really, I would place it in 2 Samuel 16 verse 14, David's fled for a few hours into the wilderness and then they they settle down for the night but they are watching through the night in case the enemy's coming up behind them and um and so he talks about that and then just to finish the story in 2 samuel in 2 samuel 17 verse 15 hushai which was one of his friends um you know passes on the uh, information of that david's enemy who betrayed him, Ahithophel, had advised Absalom correctly, really, go after David immediately. Let's let's get him while he's vulnerable. Um, and so he says in verse 16, Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, Do not spend this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily cross over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. So that message gets through to David in the wilderness, but he said, don't stay there, go and cross over the Jordan. And then it says, it's, it, and then when that message was sent to him, verse 21, it says that the, these people actually delivered that message saying, arise, cross over the water quickly, for thus has Ahithophel advised against you. And in verse 22, so David and all the people with him arose and crossed over the Jordan. By morning light, not one of them was left who had not gone over the Jordan. So there we see that in the very early hours of the morning, maybe four o'clock, in the final watch, David and his men marched and com- to the other side of the Jordan to, to a place of relative safety. And so all of this happened during this dramatic night. And during those night watches is when David would have composed this psalm in his devotion to God. And so um, it is a psalm of devotion, expressing his commitment to seek God, to praise God, to cling to God, despite all these circumstances, which in the natural, anyone, any commentator would have said, that's the end of David. He's, he's, he's finished. And so we see that in the psalm, towards the end of the psalm, we see his enemies who had slandered him. David is expecting a fight. He knows it's going to come to a battle because he talks about a sword in verse that, that his enemies are going to die by the sword in verse 10. And these enemies seek his life. That's in verse 9. And he's also confident that his victory will lead to him being restored as the king. And he will again rejoice as king. And that's in verse 11. So it fits this, this situation again in the time when he is fleeing from Absalom. And it reveals how it gives us a, a, a way, a psalm that we can pray when we are in a wilderness, when it seems that the, the natural provisions of joy uh, of life are not satisfying us uh, and it should sharpen our appetite for, as believers, for, for God, for God, to find our satisfaction in God. And so his deepest desire was for God. He had a wonderful spiritual hunger and thirst and uh and so let's let's look at first of all the first two verses which i've entitled david's longing for god his longing for god and uh verse one is is first part of verse one (laughs) has two parts that are absolutely essential how he starts by saying oh god you are my god notice he knows God as his God. He has a covenant relationship with God and he is laying hold of his covenant relationship with God. He is declaring his covenant relationship with God. You are my God. And he says, early will I seek you. And many translations say this is earnestly will I seek you. Um, because 
in a way, if you seek God early in the day, that's a sign that he's your first priority. And, and, and the two words connect together. It's really the word for seek um, that is related to the word for dawn. It's, a, it's an unusual word that's related to dawn. So it implies an earnest seeking of God, like when you would get up at dawn to seek, seek God. And that shows that God is his first priority, you know, and it is a very good example here to, you know, uh, seek God early. If you're really seeking God, you know, have time of morning prayer before you go to anything else. Make God your first priority. And then it says, if you'll seek God first, all these other things will be added to you. And so I want you to notice that he is, there are two things here that really is the foundation for the rest of the psalm. Every, the rest of the psalm is, is really a development of this, of this foundation here, which I would say is a twofold foundation. First of all, the only reason David can pray the way that he can pray in this psalm is that he knows his God. He is he knows he has a covenant relationship with God. It, it, God is his God. And so that's the first thing we need to know as a foundation, that, that God is our God. We have a covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and that's the foundation. And secondly, we need to cultivate our closeness with God, our fellowship with God. Because actually the, the purpose of relationship is fellowship. The reason why God has made a new covenant relationship with us is that so we can enjoy him and he can enjoy us forever. That's, that's the purpose of marriage, of course, is not so you've just got a piece of paper that says you have a relationship, but because you love the other person, you want to be close to them, you want, and that, you want that fellowship, and so you create this covenant relationship that makes that fellowship, enables that fellowship to thrive and, and be permanent and protected against all the things that would try and destroy it. And so he has this covenant relationship with God. He affirms that, you are my God. And secondly, he says, uh, earnestly, I, will I seek you? In other words, I, am, I want to know you more. I want to get closer to you, oh God. And, and so we, that's what we need to do. And that's what's happening in this psalm. David is turning to God in this situation and seeking God, wanting to get close to God. He wants to get God's wisdom and help. But most of all, he just wants more, more of God. He wants to be close to God. And that's the foundation, really, for the rest of the psalm. And then he, then he describes his spiritual thirst. Of course, he's in the wilderness where there isn't much water, much food or provisions. He, at this point, they had to, to flee in panic. They wouldn't have been able to bring much with them. Uh, but more than his physical thirst is his spiritual thirst for God. Notice he says, my, verse 1, the second part, my thirst, my, sorry, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In other words, he, he, he has a desire for God himself. You see, he's seeking God. He's not seeking things. He's seeking God himself. And often when we go through wilderness situations, in a way, God uses them in his plan because often we find our satisfaction in things and we don't think of God. And when we're in a really hard situation... We, that those natural satisfactions aren't working for us. And, and so the only answer really <laughs> is to try and find, to seek God and find our satisfaction in God. And that's what David is doing. He always had this heart for God, of course. He was a man after, seeking after God's heart. But the wilderness, as it were, sharpens your appetite. And so notice, he seeks you, he seeks God. My soul thirsts for you. You see, for the living God, because God is life and water is symbolic of life. So when we thirst for God, we are thirsting 
for for God, for the living God, because he is the source of all life and love and, and joy and so forth. My flesh longs for you. In other words, he also wants God's life in in his physical body, not spiritually and physically. He knows his need for God. And he says, I long for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And that, of course, is the wilderness where he is. But maybe it's a, it's a mirror of his soul that he says, God, I'm thirsty for you. I want more of you. That's, he's seeking God. He says, God, I want you. I want more of you. And I want your strength in my soul. Praise God. You know, it's good to seek God for who he is himself. And secondly, for his strength in us. We seek his face. That is, we seek to know him. But we, and we also seek his strength, his life within us. And only thirdly do we seek him for the things that we need, the physical things that we need in life. Seek his face, seek his strength, and then Jesus, then the Lord says, all these other things will be added to you. So it's not wrong to, to want those things, but the key is to seek God and his strength. And so that's what he's doing. He's, he's expressing his desire for God. And... Matthew 5, 6 actually promises. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for God's righteous life in us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so David knew that if he was looking to God for his supply, looking to God as his source, then God will surely satisfy him he believes that and so god that he god is the living source of true satisfaction praise god and when we go through a wilderness experience it helps now we you can either kind of turn away from god in in uh, upset with god blaming god or you can turn to god and say god this thank you in this situation is helping me realize that i need to seek you and I need to find my satisfaction and my strength in you. And that's what David does here. Praise God. And so, verse 2, he says, So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Now, we need to explain this a little bit. When it says, I have looked for you, this probably isn't the best translation it it would perhaps be better translated i have seen you i have beheld you in other words i i i i've experienced you before he's he's looking back at his previous experiences of god and in particular he's experienced god in the sanctuary you know, he's experienced God in the worship with with God's people. He's he says, I've I've seen you, I've I've had a revelation of you. And he's talking, of course, about seeing God through the eyes of faith. He's seen something of the reality of God, something of the beauty of God. C compare Psalm twenty seven verse four when he talks about you know, well, let me read that. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I've desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. So he sees, he's caught a vision of God, of the beauty, the holiness, the glory of God. And he's seen that. He's seen a, a vision of God's power uh, and also of God's love. In fact, isn't that how the last psalm actually ended? When he says, God has spoken to me twice. That all power belongs to God. And then he says, but not just power. Loving kindness belongs to God. And he, he has seen God's power. And he's seen God's love, as we'll see in the next verse. And he's seen God's glory. God's glory is the special presence of God that, that is with his people especially enjoyed in the sanctuary praise god and so he is actually remembering in the past how he has enjoyed the presence of god 
and his own experience of God. And that is helping him in the wilderness now. So when it says so in verse 2, it probably means in the same way that in the past I have desired you, God, and I have experienced you, your power and your glory as I worship you. So, uh, in, in, the, in that same way, so I am also focused on you now. See, right now, David was separated from the sanctuary. He didn't have that advantage of being able to, because David had actually, when he conquered Jerusalem, he took the, he built a tent and put it on the grounds of his palace. And he actually put the Ark of the Covenant in that tent. It's called the Tabernacle of David. And David and others, and they had continually, 24-7, singing and praising in that tent and right before God's throne. And David could enter in and enjoy the presence of God there. And, and of course, he misses that. But he says, have, he remembers that. And so he's saying, I desire just as I experienced you, God, back then, just as you filled my heart back then, so I desire you now. In the same way that I, I experienced you then, so I am longing for you to fill me now. Because David understood that God isn't limited to the sanctuary. He's not limited to buildings. God is present there. And David knew that he could enter into God's spiritual sanctuary uh, and receive the, the the glory and the grace of god again hallelujah and so that's what that's what he's saying but in a sense he's saying because i've tasted of your power and your glory god in the past i'm hungry for more you know because he's experienced god and found that peace and that joy he now in his wilderness situation knows that God is real and he need, he wants more of God and he desires more of God and that's that's what's going on there praise God and uh, we now are the sanctuary of God as well God isn't limited to buildings together as we gather together we're the sanctuary of God and individually notice he says he has beheld God in the sanctuary to see his power and glory in other words, God's power and glory is manifested in the sanctuary. He's manifested in us because we are temples of the living God. Praise God. And if we seek God, we will be filled with his presence, with his love, with his blessing. David knows that. And so he is seeking God in faith. Praise God. And then we see that in verse 3 to 6, we see David's devotion to God despite being away from the sanctuary and, it, and then he says in verse 3 because your loving kindness is better than life now this is a big statement the, this word loving kindness is chassid it's God's covenant love it's his love praise God his faithful love his steadfast love and here they, what the, this word because links to the past previous verse and what comes next but one thing is he's just been talking about he is thirsting for God why is he thirsting for God verse 1 and 2 he's thirsting for God why is he thirsting for God verse 3 because your loving kindness is better than life he says, I know you're a God who, who is full of love. And we are drawn to, to love. And that his loving kindness is better than life. In other words, his loving kindness is more valuable than life and all that life can offer. You know, the most valuable thing we have is, is life. We would do almost anything to hold on to life. And uh, it represents life and everything that this natural life can offer us, all its joys and whatever. He is saying God's loving kindness is better than life. It's more valuable than life. And what, the, you know, that, that's how people 
uh, have the faith to be martyred because they believe that their relationship with God is better than this life. And one reason, of course, that God's loving kindness is better than life is through your covenant relationship with God, you don't just have God's blessing in this life. You have eternal life. God's loving kindness will carry you for all eternity. Hallelujah. That's why his loving kindness is better than life. I wonder if you can say that. Lord, your loving kindness is better than life. My relationship with you, your love for me is, is more precious to me than, than life itself and everything that this life can offer. And that's why, because he valued God's love above everything else for him, that, that's why his heart pursued God. You see, the Bible says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, that which you desire, that which you value most highly, is where, what your heart will pursue. And because he valued God's presence, his glory, his loving kindness above everything else, therefore he was hungry and thirsty. He was seeking for God. That's the heart of devotion. You see, he knew that God loved him and he was seeking this loving kindness which was more precious to him than anything in this world and anything of this life. And he goes on and he says, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. And so he says, I know that when I seek your love, I will receive your love. I will experience your love. And because I will be filled with your love, praise God, I, that my heart is going to overflow in praise. So this was his experience. He's saying, I, I know I'm, I'm enjoying your love and my lips shall praise you. And David declares the, the excellency of God. Praise God. Notice David valued spiritual things more than natural things. He valued his relationship with God, his fellowship with God more than this life. And the result of that, his filling, being filled with God's love was praise to God. All right, and then he goes on, and and he says, Thus, I will bless you, praise God, which means I will speak well of you. And it also means that we can bless God by making him happy. And so we bless him by, by giving him our love. We return his love to him. Thus, I will bless you. And he, this is really a vow. I will bless you while I live. In other words, I'll bless you and I'll praise you as long as I live because I will live in your everlasting loving kindness and therefore I will continually praise you. Praise God. This is the devoted servant of God. Hallelujah. He won't just praise God when things are going well. He'll praise God in the wilderness. When life is hard, then pray harder. <laughs> And, uh, and it says, then I will lift up my hands in your name. This lifting up of the hands is, first of all, an act of worship, of surrender to God, acknowledging that God is above us. And also it's, it's, it's an open hand of receiving from God as well. Once you lift your hands to God, you can also receive all his blessing. Praise God. And so that's in 1 Timothy 2.8 as well. We are commanded to lift up our hands in worship and supplication to God. And uh, then he says, verse 5, as a result of his devotion to God, his seeking God, he says, my soul shall be satisfied. My soul, I shall be emotionally satisfied. And, and it could really mean feasted. In other words, by, by, living in, by, by loving God, at the same time as you love God, you are being filled. You are being filled with his spirit. And you, it's like you are having a feast because you are receiving his life, his strength. And so it says, my soul, 
as he communes with God, my soul shall be satisfied. Or it could literally, my soul is being feasted. As with, and that's a parallel now, with the physical feast, as with marrow and fatness, or literally fat and abundance. Okay, the, this fatness means abundance. In other words, and it's in the imperfect tense, so in other words, what he's describing is an ongoing situation. As he's seeking God, his soul is being filled and satisfied by God. And it's like as he eats and drinks, eats the word and drinks the spirit, he is having a, an abundant feast. God is satisfying him in his soul. Praise God. And, and again, he's becoming spiritually rich from feasting on God. And he says, my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. There he is, he says, the, the result of this time of being with God, communing with God, will be praise. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Because God fills us with his life, his love, his joy. And then we just want to declare it. And we want to sing it. And then he talks about this feast again. Uh, verse 6, when I remember you on my bed. So even at night, and it seems like he can't sleep, but when you can't sleep, don't count sheep, but rather meditate on God. That's the thing to do. He says, when I remember you uh, on my bed, and this word really means when I recall what God has said and done, you see, and apply it to the present situation. That's what it means. You, you remember, you bring to the forefront of your mind what God has said and done, and then you apply it to your situation. And so that's what he's doing. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. So in, even at night now, as he's composing this psalm, he's meditating on God, on his loving kindness, on his goodness, on his word. And when we meditate on God's word, you know, we are feeding. The, the, the Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4. And so the word of God is like bread. It's like food. And when we meditate on the word, we are chewing that food and we are feasting on him. And so this is David. Even at night, he is meditating on God. Hallelujah. He is feasting on God. Hallelujah. And his eyes are focused on God. And, you know, when we go through a wilderness situation, it's easy just to focus on our problems and how, how hard we've got, got it. And the answer is what David is doing, is seeking God, praising God and, and meditating on God, on God's love and just focusing on God. Praise God. And, and through that, he received strength in this situation. So in a trial, focus on the solution rather than the problem. Think deeply on the goodness, the faithfulness of God. And so this describes what we should do when we are in the wilderness. This psalm gives us that guidance of, of just drawing near to God, drinking from God, eating from God, meditating on God. And then the psalm moves. In verse 7, the psalm moves into, um, I would say, confidence. Uh, out of our communing with God, we come into a confidence, uh, an assurance, as God's strength fills our soul. I think it was uh, George Muller said, my number one aim in the morning is to make my is is to let god make my soul happy let god satisfy my soul and then i know that he will then carry me through through the day and this is what's happened here now now i want you to notice the, the confidence that he has and we see first of all that he is assured he's trusting god for protection because we're going to see the enemies soon that are are after david's life but he's trusting God. Verse 7. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. And, and he's looking back in the past. He says, you have been my help. Uh, 
and, and maybe he's thinking back when he was on the run from Saul in the wilderness and God helped him time and time again. And he says, because I know you are my help. You're the one who helps me. Therefore, I can trust in you. And he described, used that beautiful language. We've seen it before. In the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. And that, what an assurance that is, that he feels so safe. Even though these enemies are after him, he feels so safe under the shadow of God's wings that he can, all he does is, is rejoice. He's confident that God's protects him. So he's trusting in God's protection. This, of course, the shadow of the wings describes possibly a, like a, a baby bird under the covering of the, the mother's wings. Um, it also describes the, the borders of a garment. So it's kind of like the idea that we can come under God's garment of protection. And, and probably most of all, because there's a big emphasis on the, uh, the tabernacle, the sanctuary. In fact, there's a similar verse in Psalm 61, verse 4 which is just previous to this, same setting. He says, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. And notice, and many commentators relate this now to the Ark of the Covenant, because above the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God, the, the mercy seat where the blood was applied, the two ch there were two cherubim whose wings covered over that. And they, as it were, represented the covering presence, protecting presence of God. And so he's, he's thinking in the tent, in the sanctuary, in the Holy of Holies, in the secret place. When we come to his throne of grace, um, because of the blood that has been shed, we come under the covering of his wings. Uh, and we can commune with him under his protection and that i believe is david is understanding the spiritual significance of the items of the furniture particularly the ark of the covenant that when he comes into god's presence loving god trusting god he comes under the the shadow of god's wings and he feels so safe in that place of communion with god in the secret place that that he can just rejoice Praise God. And then he makes, we see his dedication here. Verse 8 is a wonderful verse that shows his dedication. It says, my soul follows close behind you. Um, a better translation probably is, my soul follows hard after you. And interestingly, this, 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 this word follows close behind or follows hard after is the same word in Genesis 2.24 where it says a man should cleave to his wife. So we a better translation again I think would be my soul cleaves to you or clings to you, uh, holds on to you in loyalty. This describes David's heart. He's clinging on to God. He's holding on to God. And it also describes a hot pursuit the, this word contains two things one is the idea of closeness and the other is a hot pursuit in other words David is hotly pursuing God he wants to cleave to God he wants to cling to God he, he's doing everything in his power to 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 lay hold of God like a hot like perhaps a man hotly pursuing a woman to to cleave to her because he wants to be with her this is what the word means. It also was used of Ruth in one, Ruth 1.14 when she clung to Naomi in loyalty and says, wherever you go, I'll go. Your God will be my God and so on. And that, that's the same word, to cleave, to cling to. I join myself to you. This was David's heart attitude. Praise God. This was his devotion to God. And as a result, we see God's, God's side on, of this relationship too it is God who so David is devoted to God but God is also devoted to David notice he says your right hand that's the strong hand 
your right hand upholds me. So as David is clinging to God, God is, God's hand is strengthening, sustaining, upholding David. And so we have this interplay here. Uh, we could say when we dedicate ourselves to God, God's spirit consecrates us. The more we f- focus and dedicate to God, the more his spirit upholds us. And so as, as David is cleaving to God, God's life is filling his heart and sustaining him. The more you dedicate to God in your morning prayer and praise God, the more his spirit will uphold you and sustain you during the day, you see. And that's when you get the experience of God carrying you along by his grace. And so you could think of it like this, that with our hand of faith, we cling to God. We lay hold of God. And when we reach out to God with our hand of faith, God reaches down with his hand of grace and lays hold of us. And his grip on us is stronger than our grip on him. Praise God. Even when our grip gets a bit weak, he will carry us through. And so we can read it both ways round. You know, my soul clings to you, God, but it's God who makes it possible because it's God's right hand who empowers us and makes it possible for us even to to cling to God but also his power sustains us and and enables us to do what we need to do and David's in this hard situation and he knows he needs God's strength to see him through it so he's clinging to God and he knows that God's hand will be upon him and bring him through this situation to victory all right wonderful verse and then we see in the last three verses david's confident expectation of victory over his enemies and vindication from their slanders that god had finished with david and he he is confident that his enemies will fail and be publicly exposed and when we read as we read on we're going to see that these are not just david's enemies they're the enemies of god and that becomes clear first of all verse 9 his enemies are doomed but those who seek my life and that's what was happening they were out to kill david those who seek my life to destroy it it says shall go into the lower parts of the earth um the lower parts of the earth is is talking this is talking about that they'll die but also after the body has died the soul certain uh, the souls will go down into a place called Sheol or Hades and where the uh, this is before the cross even believers went down under the earth but now after the cross believers go to heaven but back in old testament times they would all go down into Hades but the unbelievers would go to the lower parts of the earth you see because we, if you read Luke Luke sixteen twenty three particularly, um, it talks about how a believer dying and an unbeliever dying. The 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 unbe- the unbeliever went to a place called torments. The believer went to a place called Abraham's bosom, but they could see each other. They were both in Hades, and uh, but where the unbeliever was was. Uh, who was a a rich man, he actually had to look up to see the people in paradise, in Abraham's bosom. So therefore, you know, when it says the lower parts of the earth, that's talking about where the unbelievers went after death, the lowest parts of the earth. We see the same thing in Deuteronomy 32, 22. Deuteronomy 32:22 it says for a fire is kindled in my anger says God and shall burn to the lowest hell literally sheol or hades the lowest the lowest part that's where the unbelievers went and so he is confident that these these ones are not just rebels against David they're rebels against God and so sadly they will actually go down into 
into Hades, into torments, the lowest parts of the earth. Spurgeon puts it like this, The slayer shall be slain. The hell they brought on others shall shut its mouth on them. Every curse of them, their every curse they get, say, shall return to them. Every blow aimed against the godly will recoil on the persecutor. He who smites the believer drives a nail into his own coffin. So that's the enemies of God are doomed. Secondly, the enemies of God will be defeated and devoured. Verse 10, they shall fall. But actually in the Hebrew, this is a much more uh, dramatic statement. He says, they shall fall by the sword. Um, But more literally it is, their blood will be poured out. They will be poured out, or their blood will be poured out by the sword, by the hand of the sword. That's what it says literally. In other words, David knows there's a battle coming, but he knows that God is with him. Who can be against him? And we know what happened. I think it's in 2 Samuel 18, you can read about it, that 20,000 of this Absalom's army were killed in this battle and indeed this happened the enemy was defeated because God was with David and then it says they shall be a portion or a prey for jackals now this is the most dishonorable death possible he's saying they won't have the honor of being buried but instead they will be eaten by scavenging animals like jackals wild dogs and that's the most dishonorable death you could have you know that happened to Jezebel didn't it you can read about that in 1 Kings 21 23 and 24 9 and 10 2 Kings 9 34 to 37 because of her terrible sin she she would be eaten she wouldn't be buried but she'd be eaten by dogs and that is the the shame because of their evil rebellion and so we see they're not just the enemies of david um, but they're the enemies of of god that in fact satan was inspiring them to destroy david because by destroying david satan would bring you know try and stop the coming of the messiah who was the son of david and so there was more things at stake but Notice, David didn't execute them, but David prayed for God to deal with his enemies, and God did uh, exactly so. And so um, he says, in contrast, verse 11, um, he is confident now, in not just in his victory, but in his, uh, yes, in his victory, and in his vindication. Verse 11, but the king... And that has to be David. The king shall rejoice in God. Praise God. Right now he'd been deposed. He'd been removed from his throne. But he says, but the king shall rejoice in God. He is looking forward to the time of his triumph. When he will be vindicated. When everyone will see that actually God is with David. And God is not with his enemies. And all that the enemies had said against them was false. He will be victorious and he will be vindicated. The king shall rejoice in God. And, and it's just interesting here that through his worship of God, one of the things that true worship will bring about is the reaffirmation and the restoration of David's identity and calling as king. You know, sometimes in the wilderness we can think, well, we've lost, you know, God's calling on our life, God's purpose for our life. We've somehow lost it. It's it's gone. But God doesn't, his calling, he doesn't take back his calling. And through worshipping God in this psalm, he, David, is able to declare himself, I am the king. Even though I've been disposed as far as God has made me the king. I am the king. And his confidence, his his sense of belonging to God and being called by God is restored to him. He has that confidence. And he is sure. 
that he will not fail, that he will rejoice in triumph because God put him on the throne. And for Absalom to overthrow David from his throne, he would also have to overthrow God from his throne, which is impossible. And so David knew he was assured of his identity, of his calling as God's chosen king. Praise God. When you worship God, he will affirm whatever calling you have in your life. You will have that, that confidence that no force of darkness can destroy that. Praise God. And then he, he finishes again by declaring the vindication. Again, he compares the believers with the unbelievers. David is... Uh, those who join with David were, were the ones who were loyal to God. Those who joined with Absalom in his rebellion, they were the ones who were, you know, disloyal to God. And David contrasts them. Of course, there's always a chance to repent. While there's life, there's hope. But this is nevertheless true. He says, everyone who swears by him, who swears by God. And what this means is, when you, if you swear by God, it means when you swear by God, you are declaring your loyalty to God. It's really a, a way of describing a believer. Someone who swears by God, someone who honors God's authority and respects God's authority, um, who commits to God. And it, like in the court, you swear by God, you are committed to telling the truth. And so the, these believers are those who live by the truth, speak the truth. Um, he says, the Amplified says it this way, everyone who swears by him, that is everyone who binds himself by God's authority, acknowledging his supremacy and devoting himself to his glory and service alone. So, so it, it describes a true believer. Everyone who swears by God shall glory isn't that a great promise? Everyone who swears by God will, will have the glory of God in their life and will be able to glorify God forever. It describes, really, in a way, they will have the victory and they will, ultimately, they will glory in God's blessing forever. But, on the other hand, he says, the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. And, again, this describes those who have embraced Absalom's propaganda, his lies. And ultimately, this has a bigger application, but the, the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. Their mouths will be closed. Uh, notice David experienced much slander against him. But he says, eventually God's going to vindicate me and every mouth will be closed. But David's victory will demonstrate that they have bought into a lie. And, it, and in life, this, um, this happens in a bigger way, we'll see in a second. But their mouth is stopped one way. Either events in life will prove that they're wrong and they'll have to shut up. Or their mouth will be stopped by their going to hell, by their life ending where God will restrain them from sinning with their mouth forever. And so it's saying here, the God of truth triumphs over the, the liars and their God, who is the, the God, Satan, of course. Notice David didn't glorify, didn't rejoice in the destruction of, of his enemies, but he rejoiced in God. Uh, by the way, in the story, if you read it, there's an example of this verse in Shemai, who cursed David as he fled. and But later, after the victory, he had to beg for David's forgiveness because God had shown himself strong on David's behalf. David was vindicated. And so this is expressing David's confidence in his victory and his vindication. And notice the enemies of David are not just his enemies, but they're the enemies of God. They are rebels because they have rejected God's word and God's authority. And of course, my final comment would simply be this. This can also be read as a psalm about the greater than David, a psalm of Christ. We could read this as a psalm 
that Jesus Christ himself would have prayed as he was going through trials and tribulations. And this psalm would reveal Jesus' devotion to his Father God and how much he clung unto God and trusted God to vindicate him and give him the victory. And you could read it, or we won't go through it, but you could read it for yourself and you could see that this psalm is perfectly fulfilled by by Jesus. You can you can easily see so that when it says in verse eleven, the king shall rejoice in God, we could see that as Jesus declaring himself as the king, and he's declaring his final triumph. Praise God, and he speaks over his people and says, "Everyone who swears by him, who is loyal to God." shall glory but the mouth of those who speak lies those who embrace the lie of satan shall be stopped you know ultimately the spiritual warfare goes down to this satan lucifer in heaven originated the lie the lie that we shouldn't follow god we shouldn't worship god that we are not created by God and we, we don't owe God anything. And Satan's lie that we can be our own gods. And those who embrace the lie of Satan follow him in his rebellion against God. And this verse basically says, at the end of the psalm it says, they will all go into the lower parts of the earth and ultimately into the lake of fire. And their mouth, the mouth of them that speak lies, shall be stopped god's going to put an end to that but those who who embrace the king those who 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 join with the king um shall glory along with the king in eternal life if you join yourself to jesus praise god he will carry you through eternal life you will rejoice and glory with him that's what the last verse says. All right, well, God bless you. We've now completed Psalm 63, a wonderful psalm of devotion and confidence before God, sung in a time of, of being in the wilderness. And so a great model for us when we're in the wilderness. Amen. Amen.